Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer and personal coach, Mark Poise. And now, Rich Redman. What is up out there? Rich Redman here. It's that time. It's an exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show coming your way. I'm feeling a little rusty here, but I haven't done this in a while. Why? Because the last year I wrote a book. You know, I mean, this was very, very time consuming, but we are back. I'm committed to at least putting one of these suckers out a week. And today's really special because uh, on June 1st, which is tomorrow, this will be old news when you guys are watching this, but Today's guest, hailing from the great state of Pennsylvania, on June 1st, that's tomorrow, he's celebrating 10 years of being a top call drummer in Nashville, nine years with Tyler Farr, world-class drummers, also play with Lindsey L., Mitchell Tenpenny, Chuck Wicks, John Cicada, Lita Ford, I want to hear about that, his own band, Ghost of Gloria, he went to the famed University of Miami, studied with the world-renowned Steve Rucker, my friend, Mark Poise. What's up, man? It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, this is so long overdue. Because we jumped on this thing. I was like, how long have you been in Nashville? 10 years. That's a milestone, man. 25 for me. But it just seems like yesterday, man. It does. And and at the same time, this city has changed so much right? Um, since I moved here. And for me, I, I also spent 10 years in South Florida. So I, I've got a trend going. It seems, but I'm not planning on leaving right now. So I guess that trend <laughs> that trend is going to end. Nice. And so so it, it feels like home now after a decade. Yeah. Well, we, we built a life here. I, that was what I always uh, have told other people. When I moved to Nashville, it was like, we're going to build a life here. Like, I hope things go well, but uh, this is where home will be yes. next. And I've always told other people that when they think about moving to this town. And it is a town that you can build a, a you know, holistic life. So, We've done that, and and hopefully it continues to be kind to us. Yeah, man. You know, I'm a big fan, big fan. If anybody has ever seen your drumming, and sometimes you need a little help on the spelling of your last name, which is great. It's a nice icebreaker, and it forces people to have a conversation with you. P-O-I-E-S-Z. Poised for success. You're poised for success. Um, and so what's that family heritage, man? What is that? So uh, the name is from the German side, but I, one of my uncles is a big genealogy nerd. So he actually uncovered articles from after they came to the U.S. where it was just P O I S. So wow. somebody just somebody just got a little hairy one day <laughs> after being in the U.S. and and just made it more difficult. So yeah, German. Yes, German and Italian. German Italian, see you know, the Italian. You can see it, man, because the passion. So, if anyone has ever seen you on your YouTube channel, if they're lucky to see you live, there's maybe they're trolling you on Instagram. They can see what kind of a musician you are and a physical presence behind the instruments because the drums are are so physical. But man, you take it to the you're like playing for the nosebleeds of the nosebleeds. Like the people that are watching the people in the nosebleeds are like, look at that drummer, so physical. Um, was that always part of of your? Uh, of your playing like because take us back i think you started really young like i did like i was six or seven years old i think i didn't i didn't start as young as that i wish i did yeah. um those well, it worked out good fine it worked out fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh i saw i was like a typical kid i knew i wanted to play since kindergarten but i didn't have the opportunity until fifth grade public school choose the snare drum and play in band um right, right, right. i i didn't have that um drum kit show up at my house on christmas morning when i was four or anything right um so for me i i was always like middle school i was really just drawn to the energetic component of drums and by the time i was in high school I, you know how drummers would like cop the chops of other players that they liked right we'd steal the licks but i would steal the motion i would actually watch i'll, I'll date even myself here and say the vhs tapes Oh yeah, uh, that I had of other of other players, and I would I would slow motion it and move like them because the motion, like that transference of energy, was so exciting and captivating to me. Yeah, and getting you know being huge into rock drummers back then, you know, getting to see players like Morgan Rose, he was the first one that really just took me away at a show where I was like, there, there's something beyond the notes here that 
um, this person has and has figured out how to channel really well. So to me, that was always part of the the cake that I wanted to bake, you know, yeah. um, and, and that doesn't belong in every situation. But then I was also drawn to situations where I could bring that um, because that was part of the picture of, of, you know, getting to see other players that did that. I wanted to do that also in my own little way where somebody had a command before they even struck a drum. That yeah. stick is still in the air in transit and <laughs> everyone's watching. There's something magical about that. Yes. Well, I mean, you pull it off, man, in spades and, and inspired me. What what years were we on tour? You've been with Tyler Farr for nearly a decade, nine years, and we were on tour together one or two years, two, right? Two years. Yeah, yes. it, was, it was 14 and 15. Oh, my God. So we're going back eight, nine years. So like right at the beginning of your Nashville journey, you got this job. I did. Yeah, I, I had lived in town nine months when I got the call. From your friend uh, Tully Kennedy, actually got gave oh, me the call for Tyler. This is your dusting off history here. So, but where did Tully see you play that he knew about you? Well, he saw me working with Lindsay L, who oh. you referred me for. Oh my God, uh, you're you really said, dusting it off. Yeah. So, who, who, yeah, who knows who can run all this track stuff and and a light rig and play drums pretty well and all that with a new artist for not much money? Well, the new guy in town. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, how it all panned out you know that's amazing but, but, so, Lin so Lindsay was the 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 entry and then tully was like hey to this kid tyler farr needs a drummer like full time and he's pretty busy he's, he's on the up yeah it was it was a time a great time for tyler and you know out with lots of dates with you guys and i, I remember that being a transformative time for your camp too i think within a month or two of us being on tour together you guys got your first pyro rig yes and, oh my god and and all of the, the first few weeks of like uh mishaps with that <laughs> i don't i don't know if you if you've ever talked about those but there's that, some funny that was the first year that we used pyro and it's so funny we just uh did the cma awards in austin which are going to be in austin now for the no dallas for the next cmt awards have moved to austin for three years and the cma awards have moved to dallas for the next three years and so anyways i saw one of our old pyro guys who knows who's who he's been out with you know He's got his balls to the wall. He's doing accept. He's doing big rock shows. You know, he's like, man, we got to bring the fire back to your show. But there, there is crazy. I run into people so much that know about this story. Richie's on fire. I was there. And 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 but you were the one that was screaming, Richie's on fire. So tell everybody about that story. Well, so you this was oh, man, I think this was the second year because your riser went up really high. For the us. highest we've like, ever had was went 15 feet into the air. It was it was ridiculous. Yeah, you needed a parachute to get off this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you're there it's something about where the pyro was laid and your your cable snake stage box, cable snake, all the junk coming off the drum riser for anybody that doesn't know about that. And it, things were just not quite placed right that day. And we were playing some of those small Canadian, like B market, C market arenas. Yes. So everything's closed in. And Johnny, your, your drum tech is obviously always watching, but I think, I think he and I saw it at the same time, but I, I just run up to him and smack him because the pyro lit on fire, the things that were on the very corner of your drum riser. And to your credit, whether you saw it or not, it's just like showbiz, dude. Like you had full trust that the fire department would take would put this out and you wouldn't need to miss a note. Um, but it was <laughs> it was uh that's showbiz. It, that that's the um that's the Stonehenge moment of that tour, right? It sure was. And you were like, Richie's on fire. And everyone's like, yeah, <laughs> great night. No, the, he's on fire. So the drum riser comes down as fast as humanly possible, which is not very fast. And we're no. playing Johnny Cash. And, and, and I can't stop. You can't stop. The thing's on fire. I was just like, okay, this is my time. This is my time. And next thing I know, uh, fire extinguishers. And that was it, man. So thank yeah. you for letting everybody know that I was on fire. Yeah. I mean, true on so many levels, right? <laughs> <laughs> so fun, man. So fun. So we had that. That's kind of like a theme, like going back, like Luke Bryan did two years with us. I think Thompson Square did two years with us. You guys did too. Like, yeah, so many folks, Florida Georgia Line. 
I think Laney, may, uh, John Morgan did two years. Like so many people have to do two years. It's such a cool thing to just, you know, and you bond, man. I remember us having just such a great time and you always inspired me, you know, with your fitness because you never missed a workout. I don't know if people, if you guys are watching this, you can see that Mark is wearing a, a, a muscle suit. Um, but if you're just listening to this, this guy just walks around Nashville in this giant muscle suit, like kicking sand in guys' faces, you know, like on the oh, beach. Oh, man. Not at all. What I call my fitness routine nowadays is I'm just running from a dad bod as as hard as I can. Well, yeah. I mean, you're a family man. That's got to keep you really, really busy and super hyper organized. Is there like a family eye cal or something with alerts that go off? And like, how do you manage all that? Man, it's difficult. Um, Like sometimes you're you're just making it all up and somehow it works out. You know, on the fitness front, yesterday is a great example where the whole day was a train wreck. You know, I, I have multiple things that I do professionally and it was a crazy day and we get the girl, my daughter home from school and she's in a terrible mood and it's a <laughs> meltdown all the way until bedtime. And at like 730, I haven't even gotten my workout in and I go take the trash out and I'm like, I'm just going to go run now. Like the sun's setting. I I got to get out there. That's a beautiful time so to run. Yeah. It's like, it's like, man, it's, it's a practice in imperfect, but somehow we, we hold this thing together. You just, you patch the biggest hole in the ship at any given time. It's a delightful, it's delightful chaos, right? Yeah. On a good day. Yeah. It's not always, <laughs> not always delightful. I, I, I won't pretend that because other parents would hate me for being so, uh, so, so calm uh, about the whole thing. So Zen. Exactly. <laughs> but out there on the road, you kind of inspired me because it's like, you know, the time it takes sometimes to get a runner, you know, it's a person that's like employed by Live Nation or the venue to take us where we want to get a coffee or go to the gym. Like, oh, nearest gym is 32 minutes away. Planet Fitness. No big deal. We'll take you there. And the amount of time it takes to drive there and come back, you would have these ropes and bands and a BOSU ball and you would like a slam ball and you'd be like crunching and running the steps of the arena. I was like, that's the deal right there. That's like a Roman athlete a greek warrior it's funny because it's um now i do that it's yeah it works right like the workout that you actually fit in your day is the one that works not the one that's on your calendar but never gets completed properly nice so so for me it was like what can i do today what can i do right now and if that means it gets split in two or maybe there is a great day where we go to an awesome gym and you know work out at a at a you know college sports facility oh we, the, yeah we, we've done that weight room yeah. you know th- those are cool days but that's not my baseline my baseline is i'm going to get that heart rate up and i'm going to be sweating and there's a million ways to do it did did dr nadia azar ever get to you she was the girl that came to all the shows for five years and hooked the electrodes up to everyone she didn't i Damn. i love following her work though Yes. I mean, it's like, so I figured out that they, she figured out I burned a thousand calories in 90 minutes. So it's like, Ooh, okay. All right. That's good. That's a, yeah, I could burn off a Big Mac if I wanted to, but I probably should just stay away from the Big Mac, but that would be awesome. You got to keep in touch with her because there's, we, I'd really be curious about your heart rate mm. and, yeah, your, yeah. and your caloric I, burn. I, her work has been on my mind and, you know, I follow her and when she releases things, I'm, I'm always reading into it because I'm fascinated by that. And I think I've heard you say before that difference between activity level on a show day and a non-show day and needing to fill that gap Yeah. when, when there's not a lot of activity, you know, here you and I are, we're sitting down staring at screens, having a conversation. I got to do this all day, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's not looking good for the run, you know, but I think I'm going to do the same thing. I'll probably get off at 630 um, from my third podcast taping. And then just as the sun is setting, get out there and do the thing, man, you know? Yeah, which right. is, man, that's a win, right? Yeah, totally. But were you always so big? Because it's a big part of your physical presence. It's like there is the, you know, don't make Mark angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> Never wear green, Mark. So, uh for me you know full full disclosure here complete honesty um i was always active and i I played soccer growing up and martial arts i got my black belt at age 13 and um a, a mixed variety of martial arts but for me fitness and really working out started around 16 but it was more mental health than physical health like i i was so keenly aware of how differently i showed up in the present 
uh, especially in difficult moments, depending on my level of activity. So it's been just sort of something that accompanies me as part of that, like pursuit of sanity, like baseline sanity. Yeah. Uh, I've, I, with the exception of in college, whenever, you know, a lot of people probably say bulk up and I did some things then for a while, but I haven't tried to do building or, you know, hashtag gains or like, like none of that has been in the picture for me. It's, it's, I want to feel good. And I want to get my heart rate up. And I guess I just have a body type that it's easy for me to bulk up. But I'm usually, if, if you said, hey, you only have 15 minutes to work out, what I'm going to do is cardio. I'm yeah. not going to be doing weight training res and resistance training. Um, so for me, it's really about that the the health benefits on the other side of things. Yeah. And then now as we all get older, it's kind of nice to have that habit entrenched because it, you know, a healthy body becomes that much harder to sustain as we get older. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. yeah, big time. And that's why you're a role model for doing what you do. Well that's it's very well man, oh shucks. It's like, you know, you get a yeah, having that as part of your life will help with all those things that happen with aging. And it's like, you know, you're a young, young, spry young man, but you're 10 years older than when I met you. How did that happen? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. do I feel that? Can I still feel like I was 10 years younger? You you know? Yeah, exactly. What, what, what kind of... Uh, taxing have i done to my system in other ways you know yes yeah yeah of, of course yeah so so um what take taking us back just a little bit um you said that the drum set didn't show up when you're four years old but in middle school you're in the school band and so you're you're learning to read one and a two and three and a four and in you know, that kind of a thing oh uh, yeah that did the whole thing you know the timpani the snare drum the uh, every random instrument that you pull out of the back of the cabinet you know that hasn't been touched in 20 years um, I was just drawn to the music and then, so I, what were those ensemble, bands? What were those bands, Mark, that you were um, at the time? Oh, you mean on the, once I was playing, uh, the drum kit, yeah. I mean, early stuff, I was, I was a radio kid. The, the funny thing is like, I didn't come from a, a musical household. So what f shaped me was, you know, mid nineties, get home from school, turn on the FM radio and play to everything whether I was playing it right or not. So I'd be playing to Stone Temple Pilots and I'd be playing to the Backstreet Boys and I'd be like, whatever came on and play through all the commercials along with everything. And that's what formed me. Um, I didn't, it wasn't until a few years later that I started to have those preferences, have some disposable income to go buy music right, and right. figure out what I loved. But for me, it was, if it was on the radio, I was into it and I was learning it and I was being influenced by it without actually knowing, you know, I didn't know the drummer I was playing along to. I didn't yeah. know, I didn't know the stories, the things that immerse us now in entertainment, who produced this? What was the team? Who, you know, what label was it? Oh, that makes sense because that label also did this artist. I was blind. I was just hearing songs come across the airwaves and I was just so compelled. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do everything I could. So that's why I played in, you know, rock bands and jazz band and orchestra and marching band and everything that was available, I did. Yeah. And that's so funny is that a lot of people that will see you playing your main gig with Tyler Farr, they're like, God, that guy's an animal. They would never think that you went and played Satin Doll and, you know, your, you know, your song goes and you could like read odd times and play mallet instruments. And it's just they don't see that. So then they put you in this crazy box. But you've worked with other people over the years, like the John Cicadas of the world and the Lita Fords. So like John Cicada, that's very multicultural there's a lot of there's it's like montuno meets disco meets there's all sorts of stuff in there and i'm sure you were playing with a percussionist how did that happen what was that like because you know i know you know you were saying that you didn't come from a musical household but you had supportive parents right because somehow oh, yeah. you ended up at the university of miami which is not easy to get into very no very competitive. not at all yeah yeah so i i I am the the proud byproduct of an awesome public school music program. Yes. Um I, like I know that they they run the gamut, but like I had an amazing experience with fantastic teachers and facilities and everything. Um and a lot of them are still in my life to this day because I, I believe that that um we should stay connected to those that made such an impact on us. Sure. Um so between parents that somehow put up with hours and hours every single day in the basement and a good school system, I just said, well, what what's the path forward here? The dream is that there would be a call out of nowhere and 
the day after walking in my graduation ceremony, I'd go hop on a tour bus, but that doesn't happen. So what am I going to do until I find opportunity? So I, I just surveyed all the schools. And after, you know, exploring Miami and meeting Steve Rucker down there who runs the program and became a mentor to me immediately, I just said, this is my place. Um, and the number of drummers, a lot of whom, you know, and you've interviewed even already, I know some of them that, that are successful in the ways I wanted to be successful. There's a huge lineage that came out of Miami. Um, and it's actually not a big school or a big program. So that speaks to the overall quality that was happening at any moment there. Um, and my time there was no exception. A lot, a lot of the players that were there have done amazing things, but far and beyond what I've even done in my playing career. So I'm trying um, to think, I'm trying to do the math there of when you would have been there, like 90s? 03 to 07. Oh my God. 03 to 07. <laughs> Holy cannoli. Yeah, man. So do you have some peers that were there that went on like, so yeah, and other instruments that have like done really well? Yeah. So I, when you say other instruments, the first place that my mind goes is uh, Troy Roberts, who is one of the the top jazz sax players in the world now. And wow. I played I played in Troy's quintet at Miami, and we nice. did some awesome stuff that pushed me to my limit. And obviously, he has run far past that limit now. Um, Federico Vinver, uh, he is one of the biggest producers in pop right now. Um, we started messing around with Pro Tools together for the oh, first wow. time. Yeah, um, and sound toys. Fun- yeah, funk fusion ensemble together, and and studio jazz band together. Um, just there are there are a lot of really amazing people that have come out of that program even from my time and it's so cool to get to see them blossom in their own way danny markham who's now a nashville resident and plays with childish gambino oh the uh, percussionist was, yeah yeah she was studying classical percussion uh when i was in the drum set program <laughs> nice i'm so glad she moved to nashville because i met her at like an lp dinner at, at uh PASIC one time Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, Childish Gambino, that was really cool. And when I was living in L.A., that dude, that guy, um, what's his real name? Danny, the Childish Gambino. He's an actor because he was on, he lived a couple of houses down from this place that I was renting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't think too. of his real God-given name. If we weren't trying to find it, it would just be it right just there in the middle of our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a small world. Well, that's crazy. So that's great. So you'd got and you got the degree, right? Which doesn't always happen. Yeah. I did. Which, man, I'll be honest, I was busy enough halfway through the program that I the thought was on my mind, maybe I just drop out. Because I, I haven't ever been a school person. Um yeah. uh just I love learning, but not the structure of it. So I almost left uh, a number of times and fortunately listened to the people around me that said, dude, this is shorter. This is less of your life than you think. Just get through it. Just I'm do it. So glad I did that. Just jump through those hoops because then, you know, you have something for the four year period to just show like these and you were only 22 years old when you get out. Right. I mean, so mm-hmm. it's like, that's what I, that's what I tell kids. But I mean, every time I had to shuffle off to a physics of sound class or um, algebra, American history, I was just like, oh, what am I? This is the price of admission. So you could practice eight hours a day. You got to go to this algebra class. Yeah. And I was by my last year, I was gigging like six or seven nights a week. Yeah. So I'd be I'd be getting back home at like three AM, wake up at six thirty, be in the practice room at seven thirty, and then in sociology class or something right. by nine, you know, knocking that out. Sociology, and, you know, that's something we can use, you know. So psychology. Yeah, well, sociology. well yeah. Sociology one oh one is is basically, you know, torture, but <laughs> 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 but but those those kind of things what i tell people now that that i gained is is learning to handle all that pressure how do you do all that get almost no sleep and then show up to rehearsal with the top ensemble and crush it sight reading a chart at 400 bpm can you do that yeah you know what i mean you did it can you do that and that's really what i gained out of the experience do i remember a bunch of assignments no uh, it's it's that that is sort of a microcosm of our industry because we get put in ridiculous situations and sometimes ridiculous requests and we're supposed to crush it just like at our very best. Yes. College was a great primer for that for me. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it, it teaches all about the persistence and the determination and the follow through and just you know, the, the hoops are on fire and you got to jump through those hoops. 
Yeah, you're on fire, and you have to still crush it. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you're playing six nights a week in a very competitive, um, robust music scene where there's all sorts of music represented. I'm sure there was big bands in Miami, tons of corporate working party bands, and John Cicada. I mean, that's that's a that's a that's a big name, man. Tell us about that. Yeah, John, John, that was an amazing opportunity for me. Um, the the how of the whole thing is that John is an alum. Uh, so he he studied jazz vocal at Miami. He was uh, worked with Gloria Stefan during her biggest time. And then Emilio sort of noticed his ambitions and John's career blew up around 94 is when John blew up. Yeah. Um, so even when I was at Miami, uh john's whole team is connected to the university whether they're they're alumni or people that uh teach part-time things like that so when the opportunity came up with him it was actually the bass player that called me eric england who lives in la now uh eric and i were the rhythm section in the big band ah. so so we had just finished a few years prior you know laying that down together and then uh, they had some originally it was just one date and then it became more than that. Um, but it all was just that that alumni connection. Who can we call that we know is not going to be a completely unknown variable here? It's yeah. an easy call. That's how so many hires are made. We do the easy hire. Um, yeah. So for me, the, the best part about it, having just come out of my experience with my rock band, Ghost of Gloria, uh, was that I got to transition over to the sideman world in a way that uh, not only prepped me, because uh, yeah, we're always continually learning. You, you, you know, stepping into a gig with someone who sold thirty million records, uh, you're you're going to be learning a lot from them yeah. and their whole team. But also, that happening before I moved to Nashville was critical, at least for me, because when people meet you, they want to put you in a box. Right away. So moving to town and saying, well, yeah, you know, here's what I do. Here's what I've done just in the course of normal conversation without, you know, without forcing that it just kind of comes out. And then people see you differently than saying, I've never played anywhere or with anyone. And I want to go, you know, start from here. You know, at the time, Lower Broadway was was where that was the go to place. I think that probably still somewhat, but there's sure. other avenues that people go. Yeah. But for me, that was critical. And that's part of how Nashville happened quicker, because a few people like you sort of saw me in a different light than someone who just moved uh, from another town and was looking to make a new start. So um, I, it, it was awesome. John's an incredible singer and getting to play songs that i heard on the radio and played over on the that, radio that was a first for you right yeah that was that was the very first time and some you know some of john's biggest hits i always loved yeah. um so getting just getting to do that for the first time was awesome because as we get older we're playing with artists and we're playing hits but they're not the hits that we grew up listening to right you know they, they became sometimes we helped make them hits you know right yeah um so he he was that breakthrough for me so and then you come to Nashville. You gotta like I rem you know what you're rattling like you're rattling my cage. You're you're, you're you're dusting off the the cobwebs of the attic, um, because I remember you coming to town. I was like, hey man, there's this new kid in town, Mark. You know he played with this guy John Scotto. It's as drummers, we're connected somehow to the person that we play to. It's a great icebreaker. So it was like, oh, that probably really helped people pay attention to you to give you those first opportunities because you had something. You had a calling card. Absolutely. Yeah. My story, um, I had, I, when I moved to town, I already knew the importance of sort of controlling and helping to shape that narrative that others form about us. So my story moving to town was, well, I work with John Sakata, which is true. He was yep. still, he, his schedule is so sparse and most of it's international. So either way you're flying everywhere. So it didn't right. matter to fly from Nashville. Yeah. And then I had my home studio set up. So I was yeah. doing drum tracks. Yeah. And then I also knew I wanted to get hired for a lot of this hard hitting stuff, exactly what I ended up getting hired for. So I didn't do everything possible. I was just looking for opportunities to be seen in the light that I wanted. Yeah. And it happened to work out really well because then people said, oh, he's got experience. Uh, he's not a jerk. And we have an opportunity, you know, at that time, if you think about what was happening, with what you guys were doing and what Florida Georgia line was breaking out with. If you come to town as a rock drummer who also has your tech chops together, you're hired. Yeah. 
in in 2013 2014 boom you are hired that's amazing um, yeah yeah because so, in, so in, in, in 1997 if you moved to town as a rock drummer you had to downplay that or you had to try to be a little bit more polite in your approach so so when we recorded hicktown i was riding on crashes and sticks were falling apart and barking away on hi-hats and rim shots for breakfast i was like can we is this okay are we gonna get run out of the county are they gonna like throw us out of town um but yeah this is such a different time now and you moved to town immediately put a drum tracking space together you know i was in town for 15 years before i was like hey 2010 I'm going to start recording drums from my home. You know what I mean? That was 13 years ago. Crazy. Yeah. Well, and for me, that that was a prerequisite for um, the move to town. I actually went back and played a, a lot more of the top 40 wedding stuff for an extra six months to get that money, to get the rig, to keep the studio work that I had built in South Florida. Smart. So yeah. that some of those same producers said, I will call you if you get good gear and you can get good sounds. I'll keep calling you. So that really motivated me. Obviously, in Nashville, I knew that there would be opportunity for it, but I didn't want to lose those studio clients. You know, those yeah. the few producers that called me for every single project that either didn't have a drummer or had a bad one. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to keep that income stream. So that motivation, I knew I couldn't, I wouldn't let myself move to town until I had the gear to get some really, really good tracks from home. Nice, man. That's that's, that's, that's eye-opening. And you know what? I think it's such a small world. You know, of course, people want to work with people they know, they like, and trust. It's just the cornerstone of business. But thinking about relationships, I think um, I you first got on my radar through a mutual friend, a photographer named Sarah Berman, who you were teaching drum lessons to. And I have since hired Sarah like four or five times for photo shoots. Yeah, yeah. That's how, but that's it's, how I met you through her. I'd say her. She she's somebody that so many people in the industry know. Yeah. Um, she has just done photo shoots with so many drummers, and she's a very very kind person and wants to help and loves yeah. connecting people to each other. So you, and lots of other players in town that I know, she was my first intro for. Yeah. Hey, this guy Mark, and you know that she'd say a couple nice things, and then we get together and yeah, and over bread. a cup of coffee, we just realize, yeah. We we do hit it off, you know. Uh, haven't we drank a lot of coffee over the years? But I mean, the coffee. Now this is a great segue because I'm drinking some coffee right now, and I have drinking drank way too many cups today. But coffee is was the impetus for me to write my book, the Making It in Country Music book. And the funny thing is, is that coffee was one of the impetuses for you to create your training program because you're an educator, you're a coach, not only for drummers but for for business folks and all career trajectory so i want to get into that but a lot of people will just be asking you questions over coffee over the years and you were said the heck with this man i mean i love people but let's create a program so tell people about this program the big three so uh, i already mentioned how i moved to town and things happen pretty quick right yeah. um and so the first um sort of catalyst for all this is that i was getting hit up by so many people that said i'm moving to town i want to do what you did and i realized first i have to give the disclaimer that all this could have happened differently yeah. uh, i could be working at mcdonald's right now and just playing at home uh but what did happen what yeah. did i do right that's repeatable here are the things so i stumbled onto this phrase early on where I said, well, look, it's essentially the big three. If you play the part, look the part, and you're a good person, it's a matter of time. Oh my God, that's worth Be repeating, buddy. That's worth repeating. If you play the part, you look the part, and you're a good person, it's a matter of time because every industry needs people like that. They're competent, they belong, and they support others in yeah. a good way. Yeah. Every industry needs that. Of course, the music industry is no different. You know, This is still a job we're doing. So that was sort of a shtick that I realized I would fall back on after coffee, after coffee with people. Um, I'm still willing to meet with people over coffee because I believe in paying it forward. Somebody like you did that for me 10 years ago. I'm still so, doing it. I did it yesterday. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, maybe we need to get past coffee at some point, but, <laughs> but I still believe in doing it. What I realized was that once my coaching career started happening, which was entirely separate from music. That was just another part of me that opened up through the course of life 
and that I pers- I realized I had the time to pursue. And so I pursued it, the education, the certification and everything. And I'm, I am working with companies and big businesses and leaders. And I'm starting to see the measurable and systematic ways that they grow. And I'm like, there's nobody doing this whatsoever in the music space. And I think part of it is that so many of us are like, screw the corporate world, live the dream, you know? <laughs> so I have, to never brag, I have to brag on you, Mark, because you're talking about, you know, um, being a coach to true professionals, people at companies like AT&T, IBM, Capital One, Warner Brothers, Discovery. So you started working in the corporate space and then as a coach and had a revelation during COVID when there was more time about putting this program together for musicians. Exactly. Because what we have as musicians too often is just people saying, here's what I did. Here's my path. And then the phone call came and then the lucky break came. Well, cool. If only all those circumstances could happen in my life, then I could be just like you. But we know that's not how it happens. Every one of our paths is unique. So what could be systematic and repeatable about this? So I, that's where I realized this thing I've been telling people for so long, I can make this measurable. I could make this something we assess. And if you start measuring it, you can start improving it just like anything, if it's your fitness or your finances or whatever. Yeah. So I just had to create using these insights I would get in the corporate world with clients um, my favorite part about being a coach is I'm always learning. I, I think anyone who's not learning from their clients is probably a bad coach at heart. So I'm learning and take, having takeaways all the time. And then in the back of my mind for about a year or two, this whole thing is building up. And I finally just realized this is at a point where people can start benefiting. And there's nothing else like it because there's nothing else that has you taking a look at yourself in such a measurable way. Once you measure it, then you can create an action plan to start improving what you need to improve most, which might not be locking yourself in the practice room for longer, or it might be locking yourself in the, I don't yeah, know. Because there, there could be guys that are like highly overeducated that can jib, that can jab, that you can throw musically anything that you throw at them. They got 30 second double bass that brushes, but they can't seem to get the work. And so this, the big three program, um, there's three modules and at the end of each module, there's assessments, which I love because my program drumming in the modern world was just like, this is what I do. Steal it if you want, you know, but there's no assessments. There was no measurable. There was no accountability. It was just, it was a model of like what the old drum DVDs, the Steve Gadd up close, the Todd Superman methods and mechanics. Yours is like, Hey, you shot it on your iPhone. It looks great. It's super clear audio and it's bang, bong, bang, bong, bong. But what I love so much is that the final piece is that you give an assessment page that the person has to get a third party for to pass out. So people fill out information based on your professionalism, your likability, all that stuff without you knowing who they are. I think you can explain on, that better. Yeah. So it depends on on the area that we're assessing. Some things are better assessed by others. Some are best assessed by an expert. So uh, I, I sort of cringe when I hear you downplay your like drumming in the modern world, because that serves a really important purpose. That yeah. is all about step one, play the part. And people learn that by watching you. Um, and the assessment for step one is you actually have to get together with someone who's been there and done that like yourself or like me or a guitarist in your line of work, whatever it might be. And you are going through this assessment and they're rating you in these areas. Do the, is the playing up to par is the touch, the tone, do they have the gear they need? How do they respond to adversity in the middle of a performance? All these things. It's a systematic, like deep dive lesson with an with a pro, but with structure around it. When it comes to being a good person, uh, I realized we can't just ask people, "Are you a good person?" Check this box. I'm good. What I realized is that the corporate world has the perfect way to do that. That a 360 assessment, where we're asking, if I'm doing a 360 with someone in business, we are asking their direct reports, we're asking their colleagues, we're asking their boss and potentially people above their boss about their work and how they show up in a bunch of ways. And then they get a consolidated report that is able to measure it up against how they see themselves. 
And that is often the launching point for great coaching conversations with a coach like myself partnering with them because we can see where are the discrepancies, where are the gaps we need to close. These are the areas that offer the highest return on time and effort invested. Yeah. So that's the same thing I realized that needed to be put in an assessment like being a good person. What about the bass player you play with all the time? What about the guitarist and the singer? What about the uh, whoever it might be that you really work around a lot in good times and in bad? Let's get their responses to questions that are geared appropriately. And then you can start seeing, do I need to be better in one of these areas? Uh, and it's, it's a lot more specific than good person. I, I say that in quotes. Yeah. It gets into the nitty gritty, you know, some scenarios that actually happen for us. Uh, in, in a life of on the road, what, what others think is successful sometimes feels anything but glorious. And you know that better than anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, getting them to assess those areas, those are things that are not usually on people's mind. Um, the, I will say the look, the part assessment is the only one that people do themselves. Gotcha. Um, but that is, that is done through a series of very structured uh, analysis using certain techniques that I've encountered over the years and sort of assimilated. So the key is that people end up getting assessments from pros themselves and others, which means we've covered all the bases. You have, I mean, that's my favorite part is that is, is the, is the um, good person thing, you know, where you pass it out to other people. And I was reading some of these questions that the other people have to answer on a scale of one to 10, one through 10. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, a band like ours that has been playing together for 23 years, there's going to be some of these things where we're at a zero. Like, I mean, it's just like, you know what I mean? It's like controlling emotions or like, yeah, we, we blow our stag, but we, we, we love each other. We're in a band and we're not going anywhere. You know what I mean? So, but that's in a, in a situation where someone is really looking to like, why am I not getting the results of my career that I want? And they want to be a side man with more opportunities, bigger opportunities. I think it's so perfect. But Thank some you. of the some of the questions make me laugh because they're just like, oh my god, that would be a zero. I mean, we yeah. we haze each other, but it's just you know, it's just in such good spirit when you're around the same guys for 23 years. But I think you know, it's really really amazing, and uh, you know, I'm just gonna put it out there. It's 99 bucks, and it's 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 like nine hundred dollars underpriced because the value that's a hundred dollar product that's that's worth a million dollars. You know what I mean? It really That's is. what I've always believed in uh, is how can you deliver a lot more value than you're charging, you know, but yeah. like, and some of these things, people don't understand the impact it can have on them. But really, if you get new awareness that you never, ever had before, that's yeah. life changing. It may change the course of every part of your life. If you get key new awareness at the right time, you have to and invest and you have to invest in yourself. And I know that drummers can be really cheap. Like, think about it this way. That's a month of designer coffees. That is a couple of drum heads. That's a stick full of uh, sticks. That's uh, one fourth of a crash symbol. You know what I mean? It's like in, to invest in yourself and get the information from somebody who not only has lived it, is walking the walk and then you you know you're a uh, icf professional certified coach and the icf is the international coaching federation it sounds like you're going to run into like picard or something you know and on a on a spaceship <laughs> um but now how did you come across this and decide to get into this because i know during covid it was 700 days of madness and not being around my friends you really you really were busy man i was thank god um how, I how long my, did it take do... to get certified uh, so the ICF is basically the gold standard certification body in the coaching industry and coaching. <clears throat> a lot of people may know this if they're on social media at all. It's completely unregulated in the U.S. So it's the Wild West and anyone can call themselves a coach or a life coach or an executive coach, whatever they want. And that's what kept me from entering the space for so long is I didn't want to be seen as a charlatan yeah. that I felt like a lot of other people were. So. I said, if I can go and study the most uh, respected path to become a coach and go for those certifications, then I'll at least get rid of my own imposter syndrome and I'll, I'll feel like I really am qualified to do this. 
So I started that path before COVID, believe it or not. And I wasn't sure if I had the time to balance that and a touring schedule and studio family work. and yeah. And in the middle of it, COVID happened, which was just mind blowing because I never would have started this, taken on this financial investment at the time if if COVID already started. But what it meant for me was that suddenly I was full time immersed in the coaching thing. Uh, music, I was just playing drums to keep my chops up for whenever I would get to play again. And my work day was all my courses, my coursework, building my experience, working with my mentors. Uh, and it was about a year intensive to get my first level coaching certification and about another year after that to finally get my second level, which they call professional certified coach. Yeah. Um, the great thing about going that route for me was that's what opened the door to the corporate world because a lot of companies look for ICF credentials and coaches. So for me, I was just dealing with some imposter syndrome and things like that. But what it did was it, it enabled me to have such a broader set of experiences. Um, I don't have any plans to coach exclusively in the corporate world or leave entertainment behind, but it's proven so valuable to go get those experiences and bring them back to the music industry. Yes. Uh, and clients that reach out to me that are entertainers or performers having such a broader perspective has been so valuable because I'm not remotely the same person I was before this whole journey. Yeah. We're not the same person we were this morning before, you know what I mean? It's like pre coffee at post coffee. I mean, we're, we're constantly Two lighter. We're, 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 yeah. <laughs> Good. We're we're constantly growing and changing and evolving, and it's so funny. As I show this, um, you and I had got together for tacos in Donaldson uh, recently. It was really fun. And of course, two drummers haven't seen each other in years. We walk in, they are literally shutting off the lights. They're kicking us out. You know what I mean? And and that was a really 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 fun night. But you told me about this app called We Croak, and it basically just sends you five quotes about the fact that we are going to die it is the only thing that is certain in life that we are going to die and so it sends you five quotes about death just to kind of remind you like hey you only get one shot at this like get off the couch do the thing you're gonna do be a man of your word go lift that 30 pound plate and put it over your head you know what i mean so it's yeah. kind of fun none of my friends have downloaded it. they think it's a little grim but i <laughs> i love it man we croak I, I, yeah, I don't share that app with a lot of people because a lot of people really don't get it, but yeah. it can be powerful five times a day at random intervals. Man, that could have been a brain aneurysm. That could have been it. That's right. Was what that caught me in the middle of, maybe like ruminating about something or worrying about something that puts it in perspective so much. And then you, you get this, uh, you know, maybe a quote from, Socrates or from Aristotle Aurelius yeah. or something, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. and you're like, wow, okay, I'm totally going to shift how I approach the next minute, five minutes, 10 minutes of my life. To totally, that could have been it. totally unpaid ad. Um, but we're just, yeah, we're just true believers in the thing. Yeah. Cause if you start living your life in terms of minutes, right. Instead of hours and days, you know what I mean? It's like every minute that passes, like it takes a minute to heat this cup of coffee, but it also in that same amount of minute, you got sticks in your hand, you could do air squats. There's a million things you could do with that minute, right. That are, that are productive uh, rather than just, you know, I don't know if you ever do this, but you're, when you're watching, you know, you decide that you're going to do some little Netflix and chill time and then you can't decide between amazon paramount hulu netflix regular tv max and then you pick one platform and then you're reading you're reading all the descriptions of all the movies and, and then three hours have gone by and you haven't picked a damn thing i just you know what i did i read i read for three hours you know i browsed i browsed things i might have enjoyed this evening <laughs> yes but now i'm on the my stuff thing you could put all the stuff that you want to every one of those platforms has a my stuff or cool stuff or your watch later playlist which i've been totally um doing that thing well man i am so happy and proud for you on this on this whole thing now do you think that um you get more resistance from musicians they see you and they're like, oh, Mark's got a side hustle. He's a coach now. What is this all about, right? You get the eye rolls from musicians. But then corporate people are like, hey, man, my coach is like killing it. We get a lot done. And you know what? It's so cool and sexy. The guy's a drummer. I mean, the guy's a drummer. He plays with 20,000 people. Isn't it, don't you feel like the corporate people, like they get it more and that your other job is sexy and then musicians? Because I get nothing but resistance. Like me acting, hosting corporate events, speaking. People are like, what a 
Come on, man. You know what I mean? For musicians, they, they're so quick to do the eye roll. And I just want to say, look at man, you better get a side hustle together, man, because this the health of this industry is not looking very good. Everything's even been act- impacted. Like like the, the big earners, like the songwriters, they're being paid fractions of a penny now. You know what I mean? They have to get their song um, as a single on terrestrial radio right otherwise they're making pennies yeah so and, and pretty soon chat gpt is just going to do all of our jobs right you know I, the I only thinking, thing it can't do is twirl sticks did you actually write your blogs or are they chat gpt oh no they're me they're me okay um, i knew it because if you go to markpoise.com you've got some nice blog entries which i think are really great and you know what i was thinking about doing this some of that chat btv is so accurate I was thinking of just like coming up with subjects and then just totally putting a bunch of blog entries on my site and then I'll increase SEO. Have the robots do it. It's it's tough because, you know, you touch on if I could respond to this really general thing that you brought up about, you know, what we're doing in side hustles. It's tough if we're thinking about it just from I need more income. Yeah. But if, if we frame it from, man, what is the full potential of me? everything that I could do and create and be and express. If there was a world without money, would I do that? That's how I've always talked about music. I said, if there was a world without money, I would be doing the exact same thing. Love it. I'm already doing what I want to do. So if, if I were to not be doing the coaching thing or even this course, trying to offer value add to musicians who I love and adore and want to support. If I didn't do those things, it would just be out of fear of how somebody else sees me. But I also realized after many years that if they're spending that much time looking at me, that means that whatever they're doing is not interesting enough for them. It's not immersive enough to them. And I actually feel some compassion for that. Nice. Other than saying, no, screw you. Man. No, it, it's, it's, we all can do a lot. And if we just sort of follow that, there will be enough money there. Yeah. You know, not not to go down this like abundance rabbit hole, sort of like preaching that. But if if you are le- leveraging all of your best talents and all of your skills and investing in growth, you being a perfect example of this, man, the sky's the limit. And that's not just in a financial way. The number of people you can touch, the the amount of positivity you can add to a world that needs it. Um, it's really difficult to imagine the limits on any one of us. So for me, I just after a while said said screw it if if someone is hating on something i'm doing it's because they don't understand not because of anything else Hmm. or or they're not comfortable in their own skin or there could be also some other things there you know the yeah well and they they could not be comfortable in their own skin but also not understand you know they, they may not understand what it's like to be comfortable in their skin um there and for me to internalize any of their things Man, well, that's just a waste. You know, it's already not serving them well. It doesn't, I don't need it to be contagious to me as well. Well, can you, is that a function of a coach? Is there a potential to help someone feel more comfortable in their own skin so they can find their true path or do a better version of what they're already doing? Absolutely. Uh, the, The role of a coach is basically to anchor in the present, define a desired future, and then figure out how we're going to get there. Right. You know, that therapy is all about looking in the past, deal, living with the past, grief, trauma, things like that. But coaching is here we are. Where do you want to go and how are we going to get there? Yeah. So someone like you're describing, one of the first things that I would do is, well, what do you value? What are your your personal values? If you can live your values, you feel fulfilled. That's where the feeling of fulfillment comes from. So we would work to figure out what is the recipe for fulfilled person. X, person X. And then we say, well, what needs to happen for this? And then we start aligning every possible thing and everything that gets in the way, we will will figure out how to deal with it, how to overcome it, whatever the case might be. And we start building that person and get them to that place they wanted. The awesome thing is by the time they get there, their values may have shifted or grown or expanded. And we have yet another mountaintop that we can see. And we say, yes, let's go there. I never even imagined that that was there, but now I see it clearly and I want that. Yes. And that's the process of growth. Yeah. Oh, my God. I want to sign up for your, some coaching, man. Kick my butt, <laughs> buddy. Kick my butt. Um, yeah, so, so many interesting things. Um, it, you know, I was looking on the bio. We didn't talk about uh, – it just seems like something 
a little fun tidbit. Lita Ford, how did that happen? Oh, so Lita, um, my band goes to Gloria. Uh, tell we us, were tell us about that. Point- Oh man, you gotta you gotta try to live the dream once in your life. That's well, you know what? I heard you guys on Spotify. We got to get you guys some more listeners, man. It's amazing really? stuff. So we were around before Spotify. Uh, that's why we, there's probably very few plays on us. But um, 07 to 2012, I I tried to live the dream, and I, I was right out of college. Met this rock band, uh, and just it, it was the thing. It it. it it was the expression that I wanted, and I really believed in what we built. We built things up to touring the whole East Coast, van and trailer. We signed a big deal with EMI, and we were really on our way. Uh, not worth telling is that, yeah, it didn't end up working out. But at a time there, we we got buddy-buddy with the hard rock sort of uh, corporation. And so there were some charity events, things going on, and ultimately Lita was doing some events when she wasn't touring, so she didn't have a band. So for a, for a short time, we were her band, uh, and we oh. rehearsed up her whole show. It was kind of a great crash course for a band. We already jailed, already had all our stuff, so we would actually open sometimes for her and then play with her. So you probably made her sound like a finely tuned machine, man. That, you know what I mean? Because you guys had that thing it was almost like you know me kurt and tully you know like backing up anyone and everyone and it just was a machine stick anyone in front of us we're gonna make it work yeah and and you know what the coolest part about that though that connects to this day is that bass player has been with me with tyler farr since 2016. how about that yeah and it's like man his right hand and my right foot are they're just there and yes. I can hear him. I can hear him thinking, and he can definitely hear me thinking. And he's so kind to get out of my way when I go a little bit too far. But those bonds, like, yeah, you, there's no substitute for time together. Yeah, yeah, you know, the time in the trenches. That is where that that thing happens. Well, that is cool. And speaking of Tyler, and then in the nine years, um, you know, great music, super fun band. You know, personally and professionally, and. When you went to go get married, I subbed for you. Those are some big shoes to fill, man. Big old lead boots, man. So fun. I had to play two sound checks a day and two shows a day. And let's just say there was a lot of sweaty shirts and sweaty underwear. Yeah. That was so I, fun. I'm forever indebted to you, my friend. It was so cool, man. As, I, as I've always said, the pro thing to do if you have to sub is you send somebody better so they can't complain about it either way. Well, there's, I don't think there's better with me and you. It's just apples and oranges. We both swing for the fences. Um, but uh, it was just, and I had to really work on the, you know, the trigger pad, you know, start, stop, forward to the next one. I had a light on there and I had all the green tape all over the pads and everything. Because, you know, when you're running Ableton, man, if you miss a pad, you could just, woo. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> suddenly was you're playing this song and I'm playing that song. Yeah, that was that was time. good for me. And I always see your guitar player Gary at the guitar shop. You can't miss the cigar shop. You know, yeah. yeah oh, it can't miss him. You know, we'll sit there yeah. and talk about cigars. Oh, we had such a good time. Um, and and what's going on with Tyler? Are you guys, you have you guys have dates this year? Yeah. So Tyler has been putting out a trickle of music. Um, he just had a new single come out on Friday uh, at the end of May. So we have a moderately busy summer, not as busy as we used to be really hitting it hard. When I started with him, it was like 185 shows a year. I mean, that is touring. Um, so yeah, we're not we're not that busy, um, but we're, we're going to do some cool things, go overseas, play for some more um, troops overseas this oh, summer. that's always fun. Yeah. And uh, just kind of filling in the dates and seeing what happens with him. And um, he has a very loyal fan base so that's been fun even when there's not momentum at radio there's there's still like a relative consistency there and i just i just consider myself lucky to get to go play music for people you know yeah. um what happens who knows man you know th- this business is bigger than any one of us but um it's just for me it's like i get to do the dad thing i get to do the playing thing i get to do the coaching thing um and life's good if i can just keep everything you know, move it along. Yeah. Keep, keep every ball rolling. It It's pretty good balance. That's what I like to say. You know, everyone's like, what are you up to? I'm like, I'm moving the ball down the field. As long as you're going in the right direction and you're not stopping, it could be incrementally slow. It could be the tortoise and the hare. You could be just so slow as long as you're moving in that right direction. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, and man. You're open to the surprises along the way of the universe. The surprises of the universe. And how about the gear, man? I think you guys. You think you and I share a couple of Sabian Promark. Sabian Promark. Are, are you Evans or Remo? You went back uh, to Remo, right? I've been I've been a Remo guy since uh, ninety five. Oh, I confused you with somebody else on the Evans Remo thing. Then I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. How dare I? Um, <laughs> Everybody makes great stuff. Come on, man. Yeah, no. So yeah, uh, Sabian. Yeah, I, I've Sabian is my longest equipment relationship, and that yes. goes way, way, way back prior to Nashville or anything. Um, just yeah, happy to have that support. Been playing Ludwig for um, as an endorser for ten years, but as a player long before that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I I haven't ever made any changes actually. As long I I every company I endorsed at some point, I have never made a switch yet. And I, I haven't seen a need to. So, um I just feel fortunate that I can, you know, call these guys or email them and um get things if I need it, but also be in the loop with cool new developments and stuff like that. It's yeah. um man, when you think about where we were growing up and to be able to be in the room with people that are doing that you know whether it's the same person as it was years ago or somebody different it's just such a privilege and i think it can be easy to forget that sometimes because we're just in our lane and we're doing our work um but it's so cool to be affiliated with legends like this you know oh, it, it, and it was such a slow process that happened it's like you know if you stay on the path and you do the right thing you're a person of integrity you're a good musician you're checking all the boxes you stay in the game then your heroes will become your friends i mean you know the fact that i can text carmine apathy or something you know what i mean it's like what how did this happen you know yeah yeah, it, it, it's it's really incredible uh, the things that that you know conspire in your favor when you are just out there enough doing good things. Yeah. Now, what about the uh, Ludwig snare drums? Because I am a everyone that knows me knows that that is my nine times out of ten. The Black Beauty, the Superphonic, and the Acrylite are my first choices in the studio because and there's a reason kind of the most recorded drums in history and. You know, and every manufacturer has a nice version of those drums, but the only downside sometimes to using the actual uh, Ludwig drums is that they, I don't know, they just detune the way we hammer the drums with the rim shots. How do you keep that from happening live? But does it, did the lug locks work? So I have this shaman that I go see, and he blesses each snare drum. Before. No way. <laughs> you know it's funny though. <laughs> on on the road, I'm playing at this tank. It's an eight by fourteen copper phonic. It's freaking oh, huge. The copper and phonic. it never detunes. So I'm only half joking about the shaman thing. Like somebody blessed this drum. It's it's amazing. That's great. Um, I, I find in my experience that a drum that I'm using a lot. There's almost like a memory thing that happens and a, a studio drum that's not getting hit as regularly or it's being brought to different tuning zones it's more likely to happen but if a drum kind of lives in a space i i don't know there i can't imagine that there's any science to back this up but it's just been my experience yeah uh, if I, i'm relying on this drum in this exact way for this exact tone it almost remembers that and it doesn't want to deviate much um that's been my sort of weird sounding experience with ludwig snare drums but um that's part of why i endorse ludwig drums too though man I, I gotta i gotta nudge you a little bit here because it's like it's the loudest drum on any record now so yeah <laughs> that, that's how how can you how can you not endorse ludwig snare drum <laughs> i love oh i love that copper phonic at eight by 14. you know i i rarely do eight or oh, even at 6.5 as short as i am i i kind of try to sit a little bit lower and then what happens is if i get the 6.5 or an eight then you have to adjust your throne height yeah you know what i mean yeah. i actually had to to trim a little bit off of the rack um snare drum stand to of the big tube to get to sit low enough now i don't sit nearly as low as you do yeah. um but even still for me I, I had to make some tweaks to make it possible but and i don't know if I, it's good to sit that low you know i'd probably not but for just some reason you know it's like try to teach this old dog new tricks and it is it's tough man yeah, I would say your chiropractor probably knows if you're if you're doing okay or not, right? <laughs> well, you know, I do have some things going on back there, but what are you going to do? You just got to keep stretching and hydrating, supplementing, and working out. You know? Yeah, yeah. I'll say for me on with snare drums though that if I could only have one drum forever, it would be a six and a half by fourteen Black Beauty. Um, if you told me I had to walk in somewhere and I didn't know what I was playing, that's the drum I would take. 
Yeah. Um, and that's and the that, drum that's sitting on my stand that I just recorded with two hours ago. Well, that's you know? smart. I mean, that's really smart. And, you know, for me, it probably would be the five and a half. You know what I mean? Um, but, the yeah, the, and then, you know, sometimes you're on a session and you got this five and a half and it sounds great. It's working on everything. And then everybody goes and there's a lunch break or whatever. And you come back and you're like, I mean, throw the six and a half on there. It's got, oh, it's just got that throat of that throat, you know, that, that, oh, that anger. Yeah. 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 So that that is a uh, a good first choice, and then what do you do? Are you doing like a double ply head so you get fatness, or yeah, I I do. I've just always been two ply coated heads on snare drums. You know, some things it's like yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of incredible options out there, and yet if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is where I go. Yes. Um. So I keep things really really simple, and I I find the sounds that I'm looking for. You know that that's why I what I tell people I endorse the stuff I endorse because. It, when I play it, it sounds like drums and cymbals sound in my head. So, yeah, yeah I don't need to get fancy. If I'm already there, I'm, I'm probably good. And yeah. if somebody doesn't like it, then maybe I'm not the drummer for that project. You know, like <sighs> that's okay. Everybody's in town. You can you can hire everybody. You know, I, <laughs> um, that's it's kind of a liberating thing when you start embracing that mindset of, instead of saying I, I should I should cop everything for everyone. Like when I was in my twenties, now it's like oh man, this is this is a great vibe, and and you, you should hire this other guy for that project. He would crush it. I would I want to hear it with him on it. Oh, you know? I, you know, I agree. You know, and when I was in college, I was trying to be the guy that could do everything. But this instrument has progressed and some music has progressed in such a way that, you know, if you want, you know, like slipknot, like, you know, new metal drums with flying double bass, I'm not going to be the right guy. If you want some double bass with power, like 70s, 80s style double bass, I, I'm the right guy. You know what I mean? But if you want that, that other thing, you got, you're going to have to call somebody else. And that is an okay i'm finally at a point where i'm okay with that yeah you know Be because the thought of spending that much practice time hurts too bad <laughs> oh my god that's a young man's game man <laughs> incredible man so this is so much fun but hey so looking down the line you know five year mark you know you've been here 10 years you know, in another fight, what, what what's what's the thing? Your vision for yourself? I know that you're a, a person of progress and growth and change. You're highly motivated. What do you where do you see yourself in five years? I, what a good question. You know, I can't think of the last time I was asked that question. Um, I would like to get to see each thing that I've been working so hard at continue to grow, and that's yeah. not as as generalized a cop out as it may seem. You know. Um, musically, I'm not done. Uh, coaching could easily just pull me out of the music business if I'd let it, if I weren't careful, uh, it would just pull me away, but I'm not done musically. There's a lot I still want to do. Like my, my tank has a lot more fuel in it to burn. Yeah. And I want to see where that takes me. I want to see what that looks like. And I have no preconceptions about that. Fortunately, for the first time for years, I did have preconceptions and now I'm just open. And coaching wise, and as a course creator, and all the other things that I do, I, I feel like I'm finally open enough to be where I'm like excited to see what's about to come out, what's going to come out of me, you know, what's possible, rather than saying I have to be this, I spent enough time in that space. Yeah. Uh, and I get to do the same thing, you know, as a father and as a husband, what is what is the mark that is a father to a seven year old girl, five years from now? I'm excited to see what that is, you know, and, and, and I also want to stay in good enough shape physically and mentally and everything else so that I can really experience the best of it. So it's kind of like a, a rising tide scenario right now. Like I want all of this to grow, but I'm really open how that shows up. Yeah. I see all that for you. And I, I know in my heart of hearts, it's all going to happen. And your age, I know your age, I won't tell anybody, but it is a very magical time in a man's life. It's a really good season of life. And I feel like you're just crushing it on all ends, man. So thanks for continuing to inspire me, man. Thank you. I, I'm man. I'm, I'm just honored that you said, you, you know, your, your heroes become your friends. Uh, a guy like you 10 years ago, how fortunate I was to have coffee with you. I, well, that was, you know, I was full of gratitude that day. Oh man! And then getting, we went on tour together to, for two years. <laughs> exactly. But, but uh, I'm, I'm just, I really am honored. I'm not saying that lightly. I'm, I'm honored that that I get to consider you a friend and and hear your well wishes in that way. Likewise, my friend. And hey, to you listeners, it's Mark Poise, P O I E S Z. Even after all these years, I have to 
hooked on phonics worked for me. Mark Poise, <laughs> P-O-I-E-S-Z.com. It's your hub to learn about Mark, to hire Mark. If you want, you're a singer, songwriter, or a band, or an artist, or a producer, you want him to play on your record, he can do that thing. You can download his course, The Big Three, or you can get some coaching, man. It works for people at AT&T, IBM Capital One. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for you. Man, this is the man. Mark, thanks so much for being here, man. Thank you for having me, Rich. It's always good to be in your energetic presence, dude. Oh, man, I feel the same way. And hey, guys, I got to do it because I got a publisher and they're riding me. There's the new book, Making It in Country Music, an insider's look at the industry, published by Roman and Littlefield. You can get it at Jeff Bezos amazon.com and don't forget about our other book crash course for success five ways to supercharge your personal and professional life and our big thank to our friend jim mccarthy jim mccarthy voiceovers vos.com he produces the show he does all the file management he does all the file the heavy lifting that i my drummer brain can't wrap it just can't make it happen so we love jim mccarthy jim mccarthy voiceovers.com and if you like the show be sure to subscribe share rate and review it helps people find the show and we'll see you next time mark thanks so much man thank you this has been the rich redmond show subscribe rate and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts